this era. Is anybody, like, I'm 45. I don't know how, like, this, is, this was me at about three years old. This was going on. Organic food, new and natural. The long hair, the super, like, tasseled leather jackets. It was a really hilarious era. And, of course, politically, death of Stalin, getting rid of Berlin. Anyway, um, they, they pursued their dream, and they did. They started a hippie commune in Wisconsin. They bought about 300 acres on the super cheap. It was dilapidated. It was messy. This is Mary Ellen's kids, us. I'm the one walking away. Uh, my little sister's the one in the crop top. What she was wearing, I don't know, but, and then cousins, there were probably 13 kids living on this farm together. And it was crazy. It was a wacky thing to do. They had no money. They had very little in the way of practical skills. They built their own houses out of these recycled materials. This is an 1890s barn that was the only standing structure. But they were living the dream. They were going to sew their own clothes. They raised their own food. They, we had no television. You know, it was a very healthy, amazing environment for a kid to grow up in. Um, but it wasn't my dream. It was my mom's dream. And as I got older, I was like, I got to figure out what I want to do. So I went to college. This is a women's college in Oakland, California. It calls Mills College. And it's a great, great school. I'm a big fan of women's colleges. Um, some amazing, amazing women have come out of them. But I went to school, I think I graduated in 1990, um, which was the year that Mills College had a huge strike. The, th the trustees of the college decided it was going to be a co-ed college because it wasn't making enough money. Got to run this like a business, you know? So they announced it was going to be a co-ed college the next year, and the women went nuts. My entire graduating class shut down the campus, went on strike, really, literally blockaded buildings, went on the Donahue show. You may not remember the Donahue show. But it was a big deal, and it was very stressful. And really, my whole college experience was one of having left the farm behind and decided I'm going to do it my own way. Thank you very much, Mom. Love you. I know you're wrong about everything. So I'm going to just be my own self. And I just started doing it differently. You know, it's like, I don't want all that organic hippie food. I want to eat real normal people food. And I was like, heck with that no TV stuff. I love TV. This is great. And since I was in college, I gained like 20 pounds. And I was kind of like sluggish and depressed. And um, the strike happened. It was amazing. But it was really stressful. And so I got out of college. And I kind of didn't know what to do with myself. I was not happy with where I was. I physically did not feel good. Um, and I was struggling with, what now? So this was the question that finally distilled itself in my brain. It's one thing to grow up on a hippie commune, where you grow your own food and don't have a TV, and you're working out every day, carrying, you know, like the farmers carry the boxes, and the milking cows. It's pretty actually easy to be healthy in that environment. It is not at all easy to be healthy in the world we live in now. Everything is stacked against you. Right? Sedentary lifestyles, crappy processed food, the norms of our society. Um, and I had to figure it out. Because I didn't, at that time, I didn't want to live on the hippie commune. I really wanted to do something else. I wasn't sure what. It took me a long time. I had to figure it out for myself. And I started reading health and fitness magazines because I was like, oh, I want to learn how to be healthy. Magazines are supposed to tell you how to do that, right? <laughs> This, is, this was what I had every month. I would go to the newsstand. I'd pick up these magazines. And I, no apologies to oxygen. There's nothing wrong with oxygen or shape or self or fitness or women's health or men's health or any of that. But seriously, 860 moves for a hot upper body? Who has time to do 86 much like 860? And I was just, it was terrible. It made me feel worse about myself. Look at that. I mean. I don't know. I don't know anybody who looks like that. And by the way, now that I'm an editor of a fitness magazine, nobody does look like that. They get photoshopped to death by the time they look like this airbrush Photoshop. They're beautiful women, don't get me wrong, and they are in good shape. But she could have had three inches shaved off every part of her body by the time you see this picture. So this was no help. So I was like, OK, I got to do something different. It's, it was a long process, but I eventually kind of thought about, what if there was a healthy living magazine that addressed real people? with real bodies and real needs who live in the real world, and by the way, who are intelligent people and want to have their real life values respected and not have this six pack ab bikini body nonsense thrown in their face every month. So we started this magazine in 2001, and then the real work began. So this is great, because it's like, oh, I figured it all out. I started the magazine. I'm fantastic. Um, the reality is that I got into some serious trouble with stress. So I'm going to tell you my cautionary tale about stress. So by this time, I'd figured out how to eat 
whole foods, not processed foods. I'd figured out how to begin exercising in ways that I enjoyed, which by the way, it's like huge. It takes some experimentation to figure it out. Is it running? Is it Pilates? Do I like Zumba? Do I hate Zumba? I don't know. You have to go figure it out. So I got the health and fitness thing worked out. I got myself down to a, what felt like a very healthy weight. I felt fit and happy. But the magazine became this monster that does, had to be fed. We were doing 10 issues a year. I hadn't built my team yet. And I got a rash on my face because I was so stressed out. Has anybody ever heard of perioral dermatitis? Anybody gotten this yet? You, oh, there I saw a volunteer. You have heard of it or have you had it? Okay, okay. Well, I'm not surprised because it turns out it is a very common condition among women in their 30s in particular, which is about the time they start getting heavily into their careers and they have families. And they get so stressed out, their bodies release this cascade of inflammatory hormones and chemicals, and it shows up somewhere, often on their face. And it's perioral dermatitis means basically a dermatitis, a rash, perioral around the mouth. Fantastic, that's really helpful, isn't it? Like, oh, I have perioral dermatitis. Well, it turned out, so I asked my dermatologist, I'm like, what is causing this? And he goes, I don't know, here's a cream. Well, the cream helped, to be fair, and I'm vain enough, I didn't really want to have a rash on my face, but it kept coming back. Anytime I'd stop using the cream, back comes the rash. I was like, this sucks. And I started figuring out that it had very clear connections to my stress. So when my stress went down, it got better. So I was like, I gotta figure out how to manage my stress. And I was just working on that problem when I got, um, I'd, been, I'd gotten into running, and I was running on a regular basis, and it was really helping with my stress, because I'd get up in the morning, and I'd take this lovely run by the river road, and it was sunny, and I'd breathe, and I felt better. So one morning, I'm getting ready to go. I've got my running shoes in my hand. I'm on my way out the door. It's my commitment to myself, right? Sacred commitment. I'm working out. And I hear that little, you've got email thing that you can hear when your computer goes bing, bing, or bing, or whatever. I was like, oh, email, that must be the article that I'm hoping is going to be in fantastic shape, and I know I have to have it filed by four. I'll just look at it. Terrible mistake. So I go back over to my computer, and I sit down, and I look at it, and it's a mess. This article is so far from done, and I have no time. And I'm like, I can't run. i got to edit this thing, right? I mean, it has to be done by four. So I drop my shoes, and I start editing, but I'm so angry and my body is flooded with frustration and anxiety and fear, I can't concentrate. So I was like, okay, I have to get up, I gotta do something. And I go racing up and down the stairs in my house, trying to burn off my stress. I get to the top of the stairs and I'm sweating after my 15th flight or something. I'm breathing heavy, I'm sweating, but it hasn't helped at all. And I felt so helpless and so frustrated, I just went, ah! And I stamped my foot so hard that it broke. I heard the bone break. It went and that's a horrible feeling, let me tell you. I crumpled on the floor. I was swearing like a sailor. I had tears coming out of my eyes. I felt like such an idiot. And I, but I'm lying there after I called my dad to come get me and take me to the emergency room. I'm lying there on the floor. And it just came to me, this, I can break myself. All of us can not break ourselves. I'd been breaking myself. The rash was a sign that I was breaking myself biochemically. And apparently, I was kind of stupid and slow because I didn't get that until I actually physically, skeletally, structurally broke myself. I don't recommend doing that, by the way. It is not a time saver. I lost two days getting my foot cast and hobbling around and the stupid article. I don't even remember what happened to it. You know, it, I don't know. But this was a memorable experience. So, out of that experience, um, people often ask me, like, oh, what do you need to know to be a healthy person? And I can give you a gazillion great nutrition tips. And by the way, one thing I will tell you, you cannot exercise your way out of a bad diet. That is a quote from my friend, Dr. Mark Hyman, who is a brilliant physician. Um, and if you get a chance to read his book, The Blood Sugar Solution, it's on the New York Times bestseller list right now, along with Wheat Belly, which is another great book to read, Wheat Belly and the Blood Sugar, Blood sugar Solution. Um, all of the nutrition advice, though, in the world isn't gonna hold a candle to this. So this is important because it connects with nutrition and with exercise. So this is a river. And all rivers, it turns out, like everything in nature, tends to undulate. It doesn't go in a perfectly straight line. Everything in nature goes in cycles and it goes in waves. Light, for example, sound, all of the fundamental things we know about physics and the natural world, rivers do this. It's a serpentine pattern, which is super cool. But it's not just rivers. And by the way, let me go back to say, 
if you take the curves out of a river, which they do sometimes to make the river go faster or to get it out of the way of something that they want to build, it tends to kill the river. It does not good things to the animal life or to the natural qualities of the water. And the same is true of us. You see that fantastic wavy pattern in there? Well, we have one too. It's called ultradian rhythms. No one has ever heard of this that I know of. Every time I give a speech, I like to talk about it because it's sort of like no one knows about it. How many people have heard of circadian rhythms? A lot more. OK. And so circadian rhythms are the 24-hour rhythms of light and dark. Um, and it's, you know, you get jet lag when you're not respecting your circadian rhythms. I'm just going to do my own time check. Um, but ultradian rhythms happen many times during the course of the day. So in a 24-hour big cycle period, every 90 to 120 minutes, you'll have an energy high, and then you'll start to go into an energy trough. And this is just a normal, healthy part of an energy system. What happens is that you start out kind of like, OK, I'm feeling great. And you apply yourself either physically or mentally. You focus. You're very productive. It's great. And your body start, and your mind start to accumulate the byproducts of all that activity. Just like when you burn gas in a, in a car, there's exhaust. There's a waste product. There's a pollution. Same thing happens with us. So we build up these waste products, and we start kind of wearing ourselves out. And as we get to the top of the peak of performance, we start to experience also some stress. And after a little while, after about 90 to 120 minutes, you will start feeling distracted or irritated or hungry or like not great or it's just getting harder. And your energy is going down, and you're thinking, I need coffee. I need sugar. I need something. Um, what you need is to take a rest about, in principle, a 20-minute rest. Like, I know that's really hard, right? A 90 minutes, and then I take 20 minutes off. My boss would kill me. And I'm my own boss. I'd probably stamp my foot and hurt myself again. But taking some kind of break, even like a 10-minute break, it turns out, is really beneficial. Because during the 20 minutes or 10 minutes that you're taking a little break and looking out the window, ideally, you just lie down flat on your floor. But that doesn't, we don't usually get that opportunity. Even switching your attention from the highly focused thing you're doing to shuffling some papers or refilling your stapler or going down the hall to get a cup of tea makes a difference. Because in that period, your body is able to focus on getting rid of the other stuff and like starts to do some very interesting things in your brain I'll tell you about in a second. When you do not take a break, when you force yourself through, you can keep going, but your top performance drops each time you have don't do the break, your performance goes down. Until by mid-afternoon, you've got that hideous mid-afternoon feeling where you're like, eh, life is so hard. Oh, I don't know what. I just want to go home. Or you get a headache, or you start to be kind of a bitch to other people. Because that happens. Your mood changes. Um, and some bad stuff is happening inside your body. So interesting. The people who've done the most research on ultradian rhythms, which none of us civilians have ever heard about, uh, mostly the Defense Department. And the Defense Department has invested in this research because they've discovered, interestingly, through the research, it is not wise to have their people do things like mine sweeping or bomb defusing or intensive surveillance for longer than 120 minutes, 90 minutes in principle. So every hour and a half, they want to change the guard, basically, because after that, Guess what? They start making a lot of mistakes. They have a lot of accidents. Bad things happen that military people don't want to have happen. So um, you can take a little bit of a cue from the military, or you can read this very interesting book, The 20-Minute Break, by um, Ernest Rossi. So what happens during downtime? This is very interesting. One thing is neurological sorting and filing. During the 90 minutes that you're taking in all that information, it's sort of piling up like an inbox. During the 20 minutes you're doing something else, your brain starts to go into filing mode. Oh, this is interesting. That belongs over here. Oh, Lucy, yeah, but she talks to this person. I have to remember to, ooh. And you start, your brain starts creating neurological connections between all the pieces of information you took in. Helpful, right? It's like after a while, the inbox is so big, you don't have access to anything in it. Restoration of mental focus and thinking capacity. There's actually some very interesting biochemical, neurological things that happen that make it easy for you to return to focus. The creative connections. Part of what's happening when all that neurological connecting is going on is you're having an opportunity to connect dots you wouldn't have connected otherwise. That's why people get great ideas in the shower or when they're out on their run, right? Everyone's like, yes, the shower, ah. <laughs> this is a phenomenon. It's very interesting. Like Creativity happens when we're not busy doing stuff. We know that, and yet we somehow avoid it. 
Um, energy, uh, adenosine, how is it? adenosine triphosphate, I think it is. It's the basic source for all the energy, and so our body has to convert. It doesn't happen um, as much if you avoid these breaks. Also, your blood sugar gets rebalanced.